Greetings, Commander. Приветствую, Гр... Greetings, Commander. This is... Saludos, comandante. Me llamo Luciana y soy tu asistente de voz en cabina. Greetings, commander. Приветствую, commander.
Active Security Division. Those foes found to be in Greek will be detained. charging.
shift drive charging. Shift drive charging. Frame shift drive charging. Frame shift drive charging. Disengaged. Frame shift drive charging.
shift drive charging.
shift drive charging. Shift drive charging.
shift drive charging.
Ambrose Foundation bankrupted overnight. Four, three, two, one, engage. The family-run Ambrose Foundation, a multi-billion credit institution, has lost its entire fortune in a single day. Business analyst Marlon Royce reported on Vox Galactica. The Ambrose Foundation combines the wealth of several centuries-old royal and noble houses. It is primarily involved in corporate investment and occasional charity work. All of the changed abruptly when its accountants announced the loss of 100% of all assets, nearly 300 billion credits. Inexplicably, everything the foundation owned has been liquidated and transferred to anonymous accounts at banks scattered throughout the galaxy. Local security services are investigating a possible data hack. But of greater concern is the disappearance of family heiress Lady Tally for Ambrose. Some fear she has been kidnapped and forced to provide authorization codes to her colossal inheritance. Secret research outpost attacked. A Federal Navy vessel has reported the discovery of an unregistered outpost with all occupants murdered, following a response to an automatic distress signal. The incident is being investigated by the Federal Intelligence Agency. Senior Agent Rochelle Carey made the following statement. This remote lunar base was designed to prevent detection, and yet it has been located and invaded by unknown forces who chose to gun down its inhabitants. It appears access codes were used to bypass security systems, as there are no signs of forced entry. Initial findings suggest the outpost was dedicated to advanced nuclear research. This may have been a targeted attack in order to steal a power source, a weapon, or valuable data. We are conducting a thorough examination of the site, and expect to learn more soon. Supertech Initiative concludes. A commodity drive to revive technology company Supertech has ended successfully, with large numbers of materials being delivered. Scorpio Devoro, CEO of Supertech, announced, We are immensely grateful to Lexi October for her timely investment, to the People's Rakapula Progressive Party for organizing the campaign, and to all the traders who delivered these commodities. This has brought the company back from the brink, and secured our future. Business analysts have suggested that adding Supertech to her investment portfolio reveals Lexi October's ambitions to break into the lucrative personal computer market. Contributors to the initiative can now collect their awards from Stone Enterprise, in the Rackapula system. Campaign for New Xeno Research Center Dr. Roy Casimir, of the Holloway Bioscience Institute has announced plans to construct a research center focusing on new life forms discovered by the galactic community. The development of the Codex has led to a number of xenological discoveries. Our aim is to construct a dedicated scientific facility to analyze these incredible life forms. We therefore request quantities of cobalt, indium, and tantalum to be delivered to Williams Vision, in the Nawaru system. In addition, we ask pilots to provide us with exploration data, which will form the core of our xenological research catalog. Nawaru Crimson Bridgent has agreed to fund the initiative and reimburse contributing pilots. The initiative begins on the 7th of February 3305 and will run for one week. If the final target is met earlier than planned, the campaign will end immediately. Kincaid raises concerns after Nova Imperium. President Gibson Kincaid has sought to illustrate potential threats to the Alliance, highlighting isolationist group Nova Imperium as an example. President Kincaid said, The rise of such radical beliefs demonstrates how quickly the other superpowers might turn against us. Had the recent military conflict ended differently, the Empire would have callously abandoned humanity's united struggle against the Thargoid threat. All other leaders are looking elsewhere, pretending Nova Imperium never happened. But I have the courage to give a voice to our people's fears. The Alliance must prepare to stand alone against any aggressor, whether human or alien. Prime Minister Redmond Mahone later released a brief response. I remind President Kincaid that his focus should be on diplomatic duties, as agreed by the Assembly. Inter-superpower cooperation against the Thargoids remains unchanged, and the Empire's internal politics do not concern the Alliance. Celebrity admits to faking disappearance. The actor Consuela Knight, who recently vanished from her private yacht along with its crew, 
has been located at a luxury retreat. An anonymous reporter told Independent Newsfeed the Sovereign. Consuela Knight was spotted alive and well at the Sky Glow Havens on the Rio Archipelago, where she had been living under a false identity. When challenged, Miss Knight admitted that her disappearance was in fact an elaborate hoax. Fearing that her career was fading, she arranged her mysterious disappearance to enhance her fame, paying her crew enormous sums to follow suit. Miss Knight has now fled Rhea and is presumably living in seclusion elsewhere. Many of Knight's fans have disputed this account, claiming that such elaborate deception is out of character for the actor. Authorities have accepted the explanation, however, the investigation has been officially closed. Here are this week's main stories. Pharmaceutical giant Vandermeer Corporation has won the license to distribute Vitadine Labs' nanomedical product. In a statement, Professor Katrien Rook said the organization's infrastructure and supply routes meant the nanomeds would soon be available to the galactic community. Hadrian Augustus Taval has broadcast a message following the purge of isolationist group Nova Imperium, vowing to continue to pursue his claim on the Imperial throne. During the transmission, Val claimed to have assumed the title of the recently executed Imperator Caso Mordanticus, and accused Aris Alavigny de Val's regime of brutality and terror. In other news, actor Consuela Knight, who recently vanished from her private yacht along with its crew, has been located at a luxury retreat. When questioned, Miss Knight admitted that her disappearance was an elaborate hoax designed to enhance Knight's fans have disputed this. The Thargoids. Human Thargoid contact. The Thargoids are a non human race with a history of hostility towards humanity. The first recorded encounter with a Thargoid ship took place in 2849, although earlier undocumented encounters are believed to have taken place. In the years that followed, Contact with lone Thargoid vessels was intermittently reported. Humanity clashed with the Thargoids in the 32nd century, but details of the conflict remained scarce for many years, and it proved difficult to differentiate authentic accounts of Thargoid encounters from the sensationalist media stories of the time. The discovery of abandoned intergalactic naval reserve arm bases in 3303 did much to dispel the fog, however. A joint federal imperial initiative established in 3193 was responsible for researching the Thargoids and developing technologies to counter their aggression. But the organization's lack of accountability meant that the details of its research did not come to light until years after its dissolution. Almost all of the reliable data concerning the Thargoids has been sourced from inner facilities. This data, originally deemed highly confidential, was declassified in 3304, following a resolution from the federal government and an imperial report. Some controversy over the backing and funding of the INRA remains, however. Additional traffic reporting. Please ensure you give way to larger Discovered that Thargoid society is organized into hives, with most Thargoids falling into three categories. Queens, princesses, and drones. Queens function as reproducers, while drones serve to maintain a favorable environment for the rest of the hive. Thargoid hives can be vast, although it may be that some of the larger observed groups are in fact multiple, overlapping hives. Ultimately, little is known for sure. The average Thargoid queen is at least as intelligent as a human being, while the typical drone possesses a more rudimentary level of intelligence. 
Existing evidence suggests that queens have extremely long lifespans, living for hundreds or even thousands of years. The variable signs of queen's neurochromes suggest this might be an indicator of age. Little is known about the precise nature of Thargoids. It is likely that queens can reproduce both sexually, with other queens, and asexually. It is thought that the latter method produces drones, while the former produces a new queen. Analysis of Thargoid specimens led some Inra researchers to believe that a new queen, or princess, becomes a full queen only once it has produced drones of its own. Significantly, queens are believed to be single sex. The Thargoid's ability to reproduce asexually means that their populations can expand incredibly quickly. But it is thought that they deliberately restrict the size of the populace so as to not to deplete all available resources. There is evidence to suggest that this is sometimes achieved by culling older drones. Inra testing indicated the queens perceived drones as entirely expendable, presumably due to the ease with which they can be replaced. Indeed, a Thargoid queen appears to give no more thought to the loss of a drone than a human would an eyelash. The Thargoids. Communication. The belief that Thargoids were capable of some form of extrasensory communication spectrum electronic signal and can use this signal to control the drones and even to share their sensory input. Studies of battlefield footage certainly suggest some kind of near instantaneous communication among Thargoids and the presence of low-level radio noise in areas occupied by Thargoids indicates that they do indeed communicate via short-range electronic signals. Professor Anslow went on to claim that a queen could effectively see and hear through its drones, but her contemporaries were skeptical, dismissing the assertion as baseless. Professor Ishmael Palin, one of the galaxy's foremost experts on the Thargoids, has even gone so far as to denounce Anslow as a glory hound. Thargoids have been known to make staccato clicking noises with their mouthparts when in the presence of humans, punctuated with occasional hisses and buzzes. They've also been observed directing such noises at one another, albeit much less frequently. Professor Albert Tesro, a founding member of the Joint Superpower Initiative, Aegis, and a specialist in interspecies communication, has studied INRA audio logs and suggests probably represent some kind of language. Is it clear why the Thargoids would sometimes choose to communicate with each other vocally, given their capacity for extrasensory communication? Professor Anslow suggested that the sounds could be designed to intimidate enemies or opponents, noting that Thargoids often produce them prior to combat. Thargoid ships have been observed emitting a complex array of sounds, and in some cases, subtly changing color. The exact meaning of these behaviors has not been determined, but they appear to correspond to different emotional states. What is not known is if these sounds are produced by the pilot and amplified by the ship, or emitted by the ship itself. If the sounds originate with the pilot, it would suggest some kind of physiological connection between pilot and vessel. Given the sophistication of Thargoid bioengineering, however, it is possible that the sounds come from the ship itself, and that Thargoid ships are able to feel and communicate to a limited degree. The hulls of Thargoid ships are typically emblazoned with one of several symbols, the meaning of which is unknown. Some or possibly be an indicator of rank. The Thargoids. Physiology. Human understanding of Tharg... Four, three, two, one, engage. Which physiology is far from complete, but recovered INRA data has offered some insights into their nature. INRA records describe the average Thargoid as physically larger than a human being and generally insectoid in appearance. Thargoid biology is carbon-based, 
using an RNA like encoding for biological information, but complete chemistry is based on ammonia rather than water. Consequently, while Thargoids can comfortably tolerate environments as cold as Friendship minus 80 degrees charging. Celsius, they cannot withstand environments warmer than 45 degrees Celsius for long. According to notes compiled by Dr. Peregrine Hennig, an INRA researcher, Thargoids can survive for a significant time in the... Four, three, two, one, engage. Thank you, space without apparent discomfort and can tolerate radiation and extreme cold for far longer than a human. The Thargoids, vulnerabilities. In 3250, the INRA developed a biological weapon known as the mycoid virus for use against the Thargoids. The virus was the result of an accidental discovery made by the INRA researcher who noted that a particular strain of fungus was found to thrive on the hulls of Thargoid vessels and appeared to be digesting the material of which the ship was made. The INRA refined the fungal strain and began experimenting on living Thargoids in their spacecraft. The mycoid... Four, three, two, one, engage. ...proved to have deleterious effects on both, leading to the swift elimination of the Thargoids, active in human-occupied space at the time. It is widely assumed that since the last human-Thargoid conflict, the Thargoids have developed an immunity to the mycoid virus. The Thargoids, starships, in terms of structure and function, Thargoid vessels are radically different from anything produced by humanity and are able to navigate hyperspace in ways that are not fully understood. They are also at least partly organic, meaning that they can self-repair or heal over time. Ship Four, three, two, one, engage. Ship in general, and this restorative ability in particular, have been shown to be dependent upon the so-called Thargoid heart, a biomechanical organ found in varying quantities in different Thargoid ships. These hearts often survive the destruction of the ship, enabling them to be salvaged, although they can also be targeted and damaged with a proton They are highly corrosive, however, and require special containers for safe transport. Thargoid vessels that have sustained combat damage exhibit scar-like patterns. Drive Given that Thargoid technology is sophisticated enough for such damage to be repaired, it follows that the Thargoids might deliberately choose to preserve these scars. INRA logs document an encounter with a Thargoid mothership many times larger than... Four, three, two, one, engage. ...other Thargoid craft, against which the mycoid virus was successfully deployed, although no such vessels have been reported in recent times. The Thargoids, structures, Dozens of planets in human-occupied space are peppered with Thargoid barnacles, biological resource extractors that convert minerals into meta-alloys, a key component in the creation of Thargoid vehicles and technology. Theories that these barnacles have been genetically engineered by the Thargoids have yet to be verified. Larger structures, referred to as Thargoid surface sites, have also been discovered. These sites typically consist of a spiral-shaped structure, nestling within a shallow crater, beneath which lies a series of tunnels. At the heart of this subsurface network is a device that... Four, three, two, one, engage. Once activated, emits a holographic star map. The sites are patrolled by semi-sentient biomechanical entities called scavengers. The Thargoids, War with the Guardians. Archaeological records have revealed that the extinct, non-human civilization known as the Guardians experienced conflict with the Thargoids many thousands of years ago. Logs recovered from Guardian sites indicate that the Thargoids were the aggressor in this conflict. Having seeded Guardian space with biomechanical constructs used for resource extraction long before the emergence of the Guardian civilization, the Thargoids apparently believed they were entitled to uncontested dominion of the territory. The Guardians attempted to communicate with the Thargoids and reach a compromise, but without success. Four, three, two, one, engage. Says, over the course of the conflict, the Guardians developed new technologies to give them an advantage against the Thargoids. 
These technologies were apparently successful, forcing the Thargoids to abandon their offensive. The Thargoids. Agenda. Thargoids do not attack indiscriminately, and their choice of targets shows them to be highly intelligent. They have also conducted targeted strikes on Aegis facilities, and attacked pilots carrying Thargoid items in their cargo holds, indicating that they know they are being studied and want to halt the process. But despite their evident intelligence, they appear to be completely uninterested in meaningful communication. The engineer Ram Tan, who has extensively researched the Guardians Friendship and their drive targets, holds the view that Thargoid aggression is a product of territorialism. They seed an area with barnacles, thus laying claim to it, and return, sometimes many centuries later, to harvest the extracted resource. Four, three, two, one, engage. Any life form advanced enough to compete with them for the territory is treated as an enemy and summarily attacked. Professor Palin concurs with this view, adding that the Thargoids are apparently so determined to eliminate any threats to their long-term survival, they will not tolerate any advanced species Fuel in close sweeping. proximity. System scan complete. The Thargoids. Human-Thargoid contact. The Thargoids are a non-human race with a history of hostility towards humanity. Engaged. The first recorded encounter with a Thargoid ship took place in 2849 although earlier undocumented encounters are believed to have taken place. In the years that followed, contact with lone Thargoid vessels was intermittently reported. Humanity clashed with the Thargoids in the 32nd century, but details of the conflict remained scarce for many years, and it proved difficult to differentiate authentic accounts of Thargoid encounters from the sensationalist media stories of the time. The discovery of abandoned intergalactic naval reserve arm bases in 3303 did much to dispel the fog, however. The INRA, a joint federal imperial initiative established in 3193, was responsible for researching the Thargoids and developing technologies to counter their aggression. But the organization's lack of accountability meant that the details of its research did not come to light until years after its dissolution. Almost all of the reliable data concerning the Thargoids has been sourced from INRA facilities. Friendship this data, drive originally deemed highly confidential, was declassified in 3304, following a resolution from the federal government and an imperial decree. Some controversy over the backing and funding of the INRA remains, however. Four, three, two, one, engage. The Thargoids Society. The INRA discovered that Thargoid society is organized into hives, with most Thargoids falling into three categories queens, princesses, and drones. Queens function as reproducers, while drones serve to maintain a favorable environment for the rest of the hive. Thargoid hives can be vast, although it may be that some of the larger observed groups are in fact multiple overlapping hives. Ultimately, little is known for sure. The average Thargoid queen is at least as intelligent as a human being, while the typical drone possesses a more rudimentary level of intelligence. Existing evidence suggests that queens have extremely long lifespans, living for hundreds or even thousands of years. The variable size of queens' neurocraniums suggests this might be an indicator of age. Little is known about the precise nature of Thargoid reproduction, but it is likely that queens can reproduce both sexually, with other queens, and asexually. It is thought that the latter method produces drones, while the former produces a new queen. Analysis of Thargoid specimens led some INRA researchers to believe that a new queen, or princess, becomes a full queen only once it has produced drones of its own. Significantly, queens are believed to be single-sex, the Thargoids' ability to reproduce asexually means that their populations can expand incredibly quickly, but it is thought that they deliberately restrict the size of the populace of available resources. There is evidence to suggest that this is sometimes achieved by culling older drones. INRA testing indicated the queens perceived drones as entirely expendable, presumably due to the ease with which they can be replaced. Indeed, a Thargoid queen appears to give no more thought to the loss of a drone than a human would an eyelash. The 
Dark Wheel. Oh, they're out there all right. I've never met them, but I know they're out there. Think about how well known the stories are. Now think about how... ...off as the Dark Wheel and start trading on their reputation. Doesn't have... ...long anyway. Whenever someone tries to usurp the Dark Wheel name, sooner or later they get quietly shut down. And that's how I know. Felicity Farseer, Explorer. The Dark Wheel is the name given to a legendary group of adventurers, explorers, investigators, and treasure hunters. The existence of which is so lacking in cooperative evidence that it is generally considered a myth. The group is often mentioned in connection with the equally unsubstantiated Raxler. Those who believe in the existence of the consider it to be a continuous and clandestine organization, operating since the very earliest days of interstellar travel. According to the only most competent pilots of each generation are honored with an invitation to join the group. It is a futile attempt to contact the Dark Wheel on one's own initiative. However, it is always they who initiate contact, initially in the skies, revealing their true identity. Only once a suitable test of courage and skill has been discreetly administered and passed. Opposing theories assert that new members are selected on the basis of lineage, with existing members covertly training their children and revealing the fact of their membership only when the child is ready. Conversely, some members are believed to go to great lengths to prevent their children from ever becoming involved, since the group's secrets are dangerous. According to the self-professed Dark Wheel expert Lita Crane, a conspiracy theorist and people's journalist, who has painstakingly assembled an archive of relevant data, the original group was based in a disused starboard. Your approach is good, Commander. Perform landing checklist. The station is toward, hence wheel, and operated with a minimal power output so as to avoid detection, hence dark. Crane believes that this starport is still in use and is the only means whereby the genuine dark wheel can verify its identity. New inductees can examine the records and artifacts preserved there, and thus satisfy themselves that the group has indeed been operating for centuries. No such starport has ever been found, however, and rival experts have accused Crane of forging her evidence in order to maintain the revenue from her billions of followers. Over the years, many people have claimed to be members of the Dark Wheel, to have identified Landing some completed. or all of the group's members, or to have discovered the group's location. But the contradictory nature of these claims suggests that most of them, if not all, are untrue. In 3300, a group identifying itself as the Dark Wheel emerged in the Shinrata Desra system, which is not accessible to pilots of lower than elite rank. It is not apparent if the group is a legitimate descendant of the original Dark Wheel, a reconstruction, or merely an opportunistic imitator. The Empire. Introduction. What a piece of work is man. How noble in reason. How infinite in faculty. In form and moving. How express and admirable. In action. How like an angel. In apprehension, how like a god, the beauty of the world, the paragon of animals. Shakespeare, Hamlet. When our ancestors departed Earth, they asked themselves, which of our achievements represents the best of humanity that we may bring it with us to illumine the darkness? The Federation embroiled in a world of contracts and petty bickering, chose their constitution. They placed their trust not in man himself, but in an imperfect work of man. But my ancestor, your first emperor, was wiser. 
He knew that the best achievement of humanity was humanity itself. <laughs> there was more wisdom in a single nucleotide of his noble DNA than in all the Federation's written texts. That same wisdom still guides us now. We need no dusty documents to assert our right. We are human born to rule. And the universe awaits the firm hand of our governance. Emperor Traskin Duval II undelivered draft speech written immediately before his sudden and unexplained death. The Empire, while younger than the Federation, is easily the equal of its historic rival in terms of scale and resources. The key social distinction between the two powers is that slavery in the Empire is legal, a fact that has remained a source of controversy since its inception, both within the Empire and without. Some observers have pointed out, however, that conditions for those at the lowest levels of federal society are far worse than those experienced by imperial slaves. The popular image of the empire is one of opulence, but while pomp and pageantry may be the norm in the core imperial systems, elsewhere in imperial space, one can find myriad examples of deprivation and squalor. Indeed, the empire encompasses many striking contrasts. Sophisticated technology exists alongside an ancient Roman system of government, and the affluence of the core worlds depends on often unregulated slave labor in the wretched outer colonies. Ruthless industrial efficiency and low taxation has made the empire rich and mighty. The hierarchy of imperial society is rigid, but a citizen can always rise through the ranks if he or she becomes wealthy enough and makes the right connections. Even a slave could, in theory, become a senator. The Empire. History. The Akinar colony was founded. In the mid-23rd century, wealthy entrepreneur Marlin Duval was so frustrated with the federal government that she founded an independent colony of her own in the Akinar system, chosen for its remoteness. When Marlin was killed shortly afterwards in a flyer accident, her brother Henson Duval took over as ruler. Henson Duval the Emperor. Duval immediately abolished the fledgling democracy that Marlin had set up, and in its place, he established a system modeled on ancient Rome. He was now emperor, and his closest allies were his senators. Any colonists who might have objected were forced into silent compliance with Duval's vision. Such were his wealth and power. It was also widely believed that Marlin Duval, like Remus in ancient Rome, had been killed by her own brother nobody dared to speak out. The Mudlark Extinction The colonists were aware that the planet they had settled, Akinar 6D, had indigenous life. But at first, it wasn't appreciated that this included a sentient species, nicknamed the Mudlarks after they were observed digging through riverbank mud in search of food. Although the Mudlarks were at a pre-agricultural stage of development, they appear to have developed the beginnings of language. They also created crude forms in molded clay, with no obvious practical purpose, possibly indicating a nascent artistic culture. The mudlarks proved fatally vulnerable to the bacteria carried by the colonists, and within a few decades of the colony's founding, the species was extinct. Rumors subsequently emerged that Henson Duval had purposefully removed all traces of the mudlarks, partly in fear of federal reprisal and partly to ensure that his development plans would not be hindered by ecological constraints. The Federation attempted to reclaim Akinar. When the federal government heard rumors that Duval's colony had recklessly caused the destruction of a sentient indigenous species, they decided on military intervention. The Imperial ships beat back the federal attackers, who were unable to establish a beachhead among the airless outer worlds, and struggled to maintain supply lines so far from Earth. The federal forces eventually fell back and entrenched in the Beta Hydri system. Skirmishes with Imperial ships continued for the next 50 years, but these were unable to prevent Duval from expanding the Empire to many other worlds. 
the age of expansion. After hostilities with the Federation ceased, the Empire entered a century of growth, annexing many new systems and persuading others to join. It spent the following two centuries consolidating its new territory, appointing colonial administrators from among the noble houses of Achenar. The Empire. Society. An ancient Roman model. The Empire works on a clean system. Society is divided into tiers. Emperor, senators, patrons, clients, and then citizens, with slaves below these. Groups of patrons pledge their support to a given senator, offering military service, tax revenue, and the right to wield the patrons' votes in the Senate on their behalf. In return, the patrons are granted a measure of protection and material security, as well as having their interests represented in the Imperial Senate. Senators are responsible for deciding tax rates and welfare systems for their patrons, meaning that the lower a given senator's tax rates, the more patrons he is likely to attract. This is far from being a patron's only concern, however. Loyalty over time, ideological compatibility, family connections, and discreet private deals can all play a part in deciding which senator to back. The system extends downward through the tiers in a similar fashion, with clients pledging themselves to given patrons, and citizens pledging themselves to given clients. The votes held by the patrons actually comprise the total votes of all the clients pledged to them. Similarly, the votes held by those clients comprise the total votes of their pledged citizens. Patrons are therefore capable of investing variable degrees of power in their chosen senators, with the result that some senators are more powerful than others. Senators are responsible for those below them, meaning that everyone has a form of social security, at least in theory. Indeed, many senators take pride in the security they offer their citizens. Some have even been known to drain material independent worlds back into the capital economy, allowing them to reduce citizens' taxes and giving their own popularity a considerable boost. Patrons are free to withdraw their patronage from their chosen senator, placing the onus on the senator to represent them satisfactorily or face a loss of voting power. Rigid stratification. The division between social classes is formal, unambiguous, and strict. But there is a clear path to advancement. A person can pay a fee and petition for admittance to the rank above. In this way, slaves can become citizens too. The law is not the same for all. Senators have a responsibility to enforce the law, and they must obey the emperor's decree, but are otherwise above the law. A senator can even carry out executions personally with little, if any, fear of consequence. The Empire. Military. The Imperial Navy. Maintaining a modernized navy has always been a top priority for the Empire. The ever-present threat posed by the Federation has driven previous emperors to empty the coffers again and again for fear of being outstripped in the arms race. More recently, Funding has come from wealthy individual senators, many of whom are all too eager to gain influence within the Navy. Indeed, it has been claimed that devastating planetary mining has been carried out in order to further this cause. The Fasisi system is arguably the most significant Imperial naval base. Many officers are housed on the world of Topaz, while Peter's Wreck is home to the training centers. As well as the battle fleets, the Imperial Navy maintains a subdivision dedicated to exploring the fringes of known space. The Emperor's Own Genetic engineering is not officially tolerated in the Empire, but it does sometimes take place. One notable example is the Emperor's Own, a group of genetically engineered super soldiers deployed during the shock invasion of Mansfield Colony in the Leadler system in 2959. They proved brutally efficient overrunning the federal defenses in a mere two hours and inflicting a rare defeat upon a federal Gurkha regiment. The Empire, culture and values. The human body represents perfection. This belief, once held with mere religious intensity, 
still forms the bedrock of the empire's culture and morals. Genetic modification is frowned upon, but a degree of genetic correction is known to take place, supposedly to correct defects such as vulnerability to certain diseases. The belief in the sanctity of the human body originates with the first emperor, Henson Duval. While he did not claim to be literally descended from the gods in the manner of Roman emperors of old, he declared that his own image was the paradigm to which others ought to aspire. Households across the Subscribe empire to were required to display a statue or bust of the emperor in a place of honor. Imperial citizens are therefore expected to shun habits that corrupt or defile the human body, such as excessive indulgence in narcotics. The ownership of slaves, by contrast, is tolerated in the same way that the ownership of any beautiful work of art is tolerated. Mistreatment of slaves is thus akin to vandalism. Keeping one's own body in peak condition and adorning it with jewels and expensive clothes is not vanity, but duty. And owning well-treated slaves is also considered a sign of good character. The Emperor's word is supreme. The Emperor's successor is decided by the Senate, although the Duval dynasty has such a strong power base that the Imperial throne has only ever been occupied by members of that bloodline. For generations, genetic selection ensured that the Emperor's heir would be male, and the current ruler, Arissa Lavini Duval, is the first woman to hold the throne. Marlene Duval is sometimes described as the Empire's first female ruler, but this is incorrect. The colony she founded was a democracy. Honor is everything. The value placed on honor is a constant throughout all tiers of imperial society. Honor can be lost through various means, including leaving debts unpaid, failing to respect a superior or provide for a dependent, breaking a solemn vow, conducting combat with cowardly weapons such as nerve gas, and defiling one's own body. Slavery is acceptable, but slaves must be well treated. In the empire, it is not uncommon for the poor and disenfranchised to sign up for a period of military service in exchange for a small sum of money. A similar logic applies to imperial slavery, to the extent that someone might sell themselves into slavery to clear a debt and restore their honor. Selling oneself into slavery is a straightforward legal process and results in a guaranteed sum of money for one's family so it is a popular option for the desperate. In practice, however, many find that it takes much longer than expected to clear their debts. People are also forced into slavery against their will. Sometimes a senator will sentence a person of lower rank to be stripped of citizenship, and but it is more common to impose a fine of such magnitude that the citizen has no recourse but to sell his or herself into slavery. Slaves may also be taken prisoner following a conflict, abducted from their home, or even captured in a hijacking. While trading slaves is lawful everywhere in the empire, except on Emerald, taking new slaves outside of wartime is illegal, without the blessing of a senator. The Empire. Diplomatic relations. The Federation. Resentment of the Federation runs deep in the empire. The superpower is remembered as an oppressive, interfering force that hypocritically avoids inflicting the slightest harm on non-human life, but thinks nothing of forcibly imposing its values on its fellow humans, and lacking the freedoms and social customs that the Empire values so dearly. While open hostility has frequently been the case in the past, the current situation is one of grudging coexistence, beneath which mistrust simmers. Despite this antipathy, the Empire cooperated with the Federation in a series of joint initiatives against the Thargoids in the early 3300s. The Alliance When the Alliance was founded in 3230, following a bitter conflict with the Empire and the Federation, multiple systems defected to it from both superpowers. To the surprise of many, the Empire took very little further retributive action partly because of the ill health of the emperor of the time and partly due to a belief that the defecting systems would return to their natural home sooner or later. The empire's current attitude to the alliance is one of studied contempt. To recognize it as a threat would be too much like showing respect. 
Internal politics. Unsurprisingly, for a society so concerned with rank and influence, the empire contains a multitude of feuding power blocks. In particular, there is a good deal of bad blood between the various noble houses, whose values range from hardcore traditionalist to staunch reformist. The imperial senate is no longer as overshadowed by the emperor as it once was, and has gained sufficient strength to act as a counterbalance to the emperor's political will. The individual character of the emperor still determines the empire's overall direction, however, and the suggestion that the empire should evolve out of its old ways has proven deeply divisive. The Federation. Introduction. For I dipped into the future, far as human eye could see, saw the vision of the world and all the wonder that would be. Saw the heavens fill with commerce, argosies of magic sails, pilots of the purple twilight dropping down with costly bales. Till the war drum throbbed no longer, and the battle flags were furled in the Parliament of Man, the Federation of the World. Alfred Lord Tennyson, Loxley Hall, 1835. How then to attempt the impossible task of summing up the Federation? We are the ones who draw the lines. Our forefathers who lived through the bitter anguish of global wars, drew a line under them and declared, no more. We enshrined the rights of all citizens in our constitution, underlined them and signed. We plotted the lines that first linked the star systems, bringing humanity to the shores of new worlds opening the way to interstellar trade. And when humanity itself, in the exuberance of youth, threatened the delicate balance of alien life, again we drew a line. Thus far let us lawfully tread, and no further. Isaac Gellin, Federation President, Inaugural Speech, 2862. The Federation is the oldest of the galaxy's three superpowers, a vast geopolitical entity reaching out from the core system of Sol and encompassing a broad socio-economic spectrum. Among the myriad federal star systems, one can find extraordinary wealth, crushing poverty, and everything in between. By contrast with the Empire, which offers a social safety net in the form of state-sanctioned slavery, the poorest members of federal society have no safeguards and no way out. For them, life on the graffiti-stained streets is inescapable, and the gulf between their lives and those of the super-rich could not be more insurmountable. At its best, the Federation embodies the values of its founding nations, democracy, industry, and liberty, but federal society can also be competitive and unforgiving. Corporations wield too much power, politicians are often corrupt, and a sink or swim ethos prevails. The Federation. History. The nations of Earth united in the aftermath of war. After the devastation of World War III, the United States of the Americas rose to become the planet's dominant nation. Over the following years, it gradually brought the other nations of the world under its aegis. Called at first the Federation of the USA, the expanding democracy was soon given the less exclusive title of the Federation. Humanity reached for the stars. When faster than light century, several terrestrial corporations competed fiercely to establish the first human colony in a new star system. Tau Ceti was the first system to be colonized, followed by Delta Pavonis, Beta Hydria, and Altair. In their wake, there followed a wild scramble of pioneering expeditions and colonial ventures. The first colony rebelled. The year 2161 saw a dispute between the colony of Tau Ceti III and the Federation Authority, 
centered on the colonists' repeated refusal to limit the damage they were inflicting on the alien ecosystem. Earth dispatched a fleet with orders to revoke the colony's charter. The colony responded by declaring independence. A military stalemate led to grudging compromise, and the federal accord resulted, granting the system rights and representation along with concomitant duties. The Federation, born on Earth, was now an association of star systems. The birthright wars gave corporations preferential treatment. Starting in 2621, a group of corporations subjected the federal government to over a century of unrelenting war. to buy up underexploited colonial land. Under ready, the terms commander. of the original charters, the land belonged to the colonists and their descendants, regardless of their ability to mine, farm, or otherwise exploit it, meaning that immense resources were lying untapped. The corporations argued that with the machinery, workforce and fleets at their disposal, they could tap those resources, the Federation would be enriched, the original owners would be compensated, and everyone would be satisfied. Drive the Federation charging. bowed to pressure and allowed compulsory purchase of the family's land, albeit for far less than the expected sums. Outrage, rebellion, and in one case, the defiant resettlement of an in Four, three, two, one. Colony resulted. The Federation's detractors often point to this dark episode as indicative of its true nature, a mere administrative puppet bent to the will of rapacious corporations. The Federation. Society. A federated democracy. The Federation's legislative body is made up of congressmen elected to represent their system or state. Apart from the oldest core system, such as Sol, which encompasses multiple states, each star system within the Federation is considered a single state. New colonies do not Friendship qualify for full Federation charging. membership until and unless they fulfill the development objectives set down for them. With self-reliance comes representation. The Federal Government has its seat on Mars, which was terraformed. Four, three, two. In 2286, Congress was moved there from Earth in the early third millennium. The executive branch is headed by an elected president with a fixed eight-year term. Constitutional rights obtain. The sovereign rights of all individuals are enshrined in the Constitution which is a modified and streamlined version of the U.S. Constitution, originally codified in the 18th century. The right to liberty underscores the absolute ban on slavery within the Federation and is a point of contention with the Empire. Corporate interests dominate. Although the Federation is loudly and proudly democratic, corporations still exercise tremendous... Four, three, two... over the democratic process, shaping citizens' choices through celebrity endorsement, lobbying, and occasionally outright corruption. The government is notoriously reluctant to curb corporate activity. The typical question in Congress is not whether a given policy will favor corporate interests, but which ones it will favor. Competition between corporations for Congress support can lead to a deadlock in the government. The Federation, military, the Federal Navy. The Federation has maintained a battle fleet since the days of the first Federal colony, which was established in the Tau Ceti system. Its official mandate is to protect shipping and defend the borders of Federal space, but it has also frequently been deployed against the Federation's own rebellious citizens. At first, the Federation's member systems were required to contribute to the required ships, making the mustering process a cumbersome one. But following the birthright wars, corporations were chartered to produce centralized fleets, which made for a far more efficient system. 
The Naval Shipyards and Training Academy were originally based in the Anlave system, but the Academy has since been moved to the custom world of Navy Central in Eta Cassiopeia. The Navy benefited from massive investment following the forced sell-off of colonial land in the birthright. It was wielded against the colonists in a bitterly resented move. When the Thargoids were first encountered in 2849, the Navy was boosted once again in fear of the alien threat, and a further bolstering followed in 2867, in the aftermath of what were believed to be Thargoid attacks. Governor Raul Santorini championed heavy cuts to the Navy budget in 3022, which were not reversed until President Varian Scott came to power in 3144. Scott talked up the Thargoid threat, again increasing funding to the Navy and removing the requirement for military actions to be approved by congressional vote. Land Forces In addition to the rank and file, the Federation still enjoys the loyal service of special military divisions, such as the Gurkha Regiment, who have served since the days of Earth. Keeping up long-standing traditions such as this is an important link to the past for federal citizens. The Federation. Culture and values. If you want to eat, you have to work. The Federation has no room for freeloaders. It has nurtured the core frontier values of self-reliance and entrepreneurship since its inception and respects the self-made citizen. This insistence upon paying your way and pulling your weight also applied, notoriously, to the process whereby new colonies were established, until a given colony was able to fulfill the development goals set down for it by the Federation, it could only ever be a dependency with no voice of its own. Given that the Federation's assigned goals could vary wildly from one colony to the next, this requirement frequently chafed with the colonists. While the Federation maintained that it was simply exercising flexibility, since no two worlds were the same, some colonies were tempted away to the Empire by the promise of being recognized as sovereign without having to jump through arbitrary hoops. Corporations took humanity into space. The Federation has never forgotten the role played by private enterprise in the initial migration from Earth. Corporations enjoy substantial freedom and influence under the Federation, so much so that it often seems they are the powers truly running the show. Federal citizens can be as passionately loyal to their corporations as they would be to a family or clan group, and it is common for successive generations of a given family to serve the same corporation. Harvest the limitless riches of space, but respect non-human life. The Federation and the Empire have hugely differing views on the primacy of humanity in the cosmos. While the Federation insists that its colonies treat indigenous non-human life with care, the Empire typically takes a more human-centric approach. This attitude has allowed the Empire to poach several developing Federation colonies who felt themselves hamstrung by ecological regulations. Wealth is freedom. Federal citizens actively embrace corporate culture, expressing their identity through brand choices and media consumption. The Federation. Diplomatic relations. The Empire. In 2292, a group of colonists established a settlement on Akinar 6D, chosen for its remoteness. The original intent was merely to live free from interference, but autocrat Henson Duval rapidly took control which have a presence in both territories, and thus act as a stabilizing influence.
message. Gushemeyer, Foxtrot Romeo, Yankee. The Federation welcomes you. Follow station protocols and enjoy your visit, Commander.
cargo hold at maximum capacity.
Roger. Tally present startup. Good to have you on the team, Commander. All clear, Commander. Put me in the thick of it. Multiple targets in this area, Commander. Could be dangerous.
targets in this area, Commander. Could be dangerous. Copy that, Commander. Engaging enemy now.
at Romeo Junction. Station services are prepped for your arrival. Greetings, Commander. Landing authorized. Assigned to landing pad 4-0. Incoming message.
Would you personally recommend this game? Yes. Okay, thanks. 